bra. I don't even know what to say. This is normally like fun. This is just they tortured him. Why did he quit? What did he even win? <laughs> oh, Nazubi, it's not even your real name. Just before we get started, I do want to say that today's video is brought to you by one of my absolute favorite sponsors, and that would be Vessies. Look, I wear Vessies all the time. They are 100% waterproof shoes. These are my kind of daily wearers that I've been wearing a lot lately. You've probably seen these ones before. They are shoes that just look like regular shoes, but they're made out of a material which uh, apparently is not magic, but it behaves like it. It's called Dymatex. I've been wearing these pretty solidly since, uh, I guess, the summer. And they are so waterproof that you can stand in a river. There is some B-roll of me doing this right now. And they are like Wellington boots or, you know, rubber boots. I don't know what Americans call these, but, you know, like fully waterproof boots. And uh, you just don't get wet. It comes off here like, you know, on a duck. It's incredible because it's made of something called Dymatex. These are some of their latest shoes. These have a little bit beefier soles and are perfect for winter weather. They're called the Stormburst Shoe. And uh, also 100% waterproof, made of that Dymatex stuff. Oh, they also do this dual climate stuff. Like I said, I was wearing these uh, boots, these like shoes in the summer and they keep my feet cool. It's now like minus six outside and they keep my feet warm. I don't know how they do it. Uh, again, possibly magic. They've got tons of different styles, whatever you're up to. So just go to vessi.com slash brainblaze and get your Vessi sneakers in the size you want. Use my code brainblaze for 15% off your entire order. Uh, Vessies are fantastic. It's just the best shoes. Go buy them. And now today's video. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. Hi, as always, I'm your host here. Japan's craziest game show, torturing people with ratings. And I know, like, if this was, like, Britain's craziest game show, torturing people with ratings, it would always be, like, some way that, you know, they weren't really torturing anyone. But Japan, I'd be like, I don't know. I've seen those YouTube clips and stuff. This is probably like the show where it's like, we'll give you a thousand yen to tear out one of your fingernails. You know, because it's Japan. Gets crazy. Uh, if you're new to the show, I'm in Sierra, one of my writers in this case, Kevin writes me a script. I'm going to read it, never read it before. That's the format. Let's go. When I mention Japanese game shows, there's likely one of two things that comes to mind. The first are physical competitions that usually end with the contestants wiping out in hilarious fashion. One of the most famous is Takeshi's Castle. Oh my god. I remember that from being a kid. Wow, that's a blast from the past, which aired in the United States as Most Extreme Elimination Challenge, or MXC. No, we just called it Takeshi's Castle in the UK. MXC used clips from the original show that were humorously dubbed over, so I'm sorry anyone who believes that one of the hosts was really a Frenchman named Guy Ledouche. <laughs> Mwah! There's a variety of these shows, and many of them have been recreated for American audiences. Things like Wipeout, Hole in the Wall, and unsurprisingly, American Ninja Warrior. I've seen none of those. Maybe... Was one called Wipeout? I feel like maybe we had Wipeout in the UK as well. Was that like where they do the obstacle course and shit has to wipe them out? That feels about right, doesn't it? These all have their roots in Japanese game shows. These are all mostly harmless fun, even if the whole point is to laugh at the expense of the contestants, except for Ninja Warrior, which is just a raw display of competitive athleticism. I know nothing about it. Uh, I've heard of it vaguely, but I don't know anything. The other types of Japanese game show that you're likely familiar with are the ones that don't actually exist. Japanese sketch comedy shows love having skits featuring insane game shows that nobody in their right mind would create. Wait, are all those things not actually real? <laughs> Wasn't the one where a guy has to live like, naked in a room? He's just like naked <laughs> in a room. I don't remember why, but he is. Is that not real? Although I'm like, that's not that crazy, because there's a show called Naked and Alone where they drop naked people off in the jungle and expect them to survive. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? It's like we actually... Have you guys seen that movie Idiocracy? Where it's like, you know, everyone in the future is dumb because all the dumb people just have sex more and have more stupid children. And why doesn't that happen? Why do we get smarter? Because, I mean, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But look, it's feel, I feel like we're living in that world sometimes because of the, the things like this existing. Naked and f***ing alone? What the f***, man? <laughs> Despite these all being fake, once clips began to circulate online, they have a tendency to be reported on by Western media as if they were real shows. I hate to disappoint you, but the show Orgasm Wars, in which a stray man had to prove how straight he was by trying to endure 40 minutes of fellatio from another man without climaxing, was not a real show. It was just a sketch on a variety show. Oh my god, and there goes my monetization. What the f*** is that? <laughs> when it comes to crazy Japanese game shows, most of the examples you'll have seen are either comedy sketches or straight-up porn, and since the latter tends to revolve around family-themed game shows, shame on all of you who believed they were real, which is my experience with about 90% of viewers. 
I didn't know about the porn ones. <laughs> when it comes to actual crazy game shows, the Japanese have much more creative premises than just tricking people into incest. Lot's daughters actually thought of that thousands of years ago. <laughs> A great source for reality TV shows, the Bible. So it's time for some fresh ideas. Ideas that would culminate with this brand of show being forced off the air after the Japanese government cracked down on torture-themed television. What? The fact that that's something that the government needs to crack down on is insane. And all <laughs> those people are like, I don't believe that the government has any place in my house. Hey, listen, what? I'm here to warn people. You keep telling me to shut up. This isn't a game. And it's like... Yeah, but when some some like sometimes regulations good, <laughs> sometimes regulations a good thing, like regulating against torture on game shows. <laughs> and unlike the game show where a man has to eat spaghetti while spinning in a dryer, this show is very much real. Sasuna Denpa Shonen. Oh, and by the way, there's going to be lots of Japanese pronunciation in this episode, which I'm not going to look up, and I'm just going to guess. <laughs> If you're not into that, you can stop watching now, I don't care. Sasuna Denpa Shonen translate to Do Not Proceed, Proceed Crazy Youth. The title is actually a pun based off the name of its predecessor, Sasume Denpa Shonen, which means Onward Crazy Youth. It was a... I guess it's funnier in Japanese. It was a similar reality style show featuring people in horrible situations, but it wasn't nearly as bad. According to IMDb, one special episode of the original series also featured Yasser Arafat as himself. Okay, <laughs> the special was called Denpa Shonen International, and it featured segments that were shot outside of Japan. One of the main challenges on the show was contestants to visit world leaders without an appointment to perform various tasks. Oh my god, <laughs> are they not getting shot? One contestant sang the Japanese children's song Ladybug Samba to Yasser Arafat. Another was tasked with visiting as many world leaders as possible simply to say the words, I hate you to them. He succeeded in doing so to Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Oh, dude. Jimmy Carter. Though in 1995, Carter would hardly be considered a world leader anymore. Jimmy Carter's still alive, isn't he? Which is kind of having like 17 presidents since him died. He must be like 170. It's Jimmy Carter. Also, dick move. Yeah, Jimmy Carter, isn't he one that everyone likes? Isn't everybody on board with Jimmy Carter being a good guy? And being like, let's let him live forever? And who's that other guy? Oh, f the other guy who lives forever and everyone doesn't like. <laughs> What's his name? It always surprises me that he's still alive. The 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 Cold War dude. Um, was he Kennedy's Secretary of State? Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, still alive. Hey Siri, is Henry Kissinger still alive? I don't want web results, Siri. Just tell me. Hey Siri, is Henry Kissinger dead? Nice, no, still alive. He's 99. He's going to be 100 in May. <laughs> Any day now. Any day now, Henry. <laughs> nah, it's cool. I'm sorry, Henry. I didn't mean it. Why won't you die? Probably be Dr. Kissinger <laughs> to me, wouldn't it be? I'm assuming he's a doctor. I'm just going to assume that. He's got. He's had enough years to become one. Doesn't it? You know, if you live into 100, you got to do that at some point. Come on. Lazy bones. Somehow, a contestant was able to meet with Vladimir Zhirinovsky, leader of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, and play him a game of rock, paper, scissors. Another was tasked with shaving Fidel Castro's beard, though that contestant unfortunately failed. How the other succeeded is actually beyond me. Oh my god, me too, Kevin. What the? That all seems a bit weird, but it's still light-hearted fun, mostly. Randomly going up to Nelson Mandela and saying, I hate you, is pretty mean, but if that's the worst thing that happened to him on that day, then he was doing just fine. A couple of other challenges, however, weren't quite as cheerful. Wait, <laughs> Henry, uh, Henry, <laughs> Kevin, what sort of life do you lead? Where you're like, oh, though, the worst thing that happened to me that day was someone came up to me and randomly told me they hate me. That would be like the worst, that would definitely be the worst thing that happens to me on a regular day. Most people don't come up to me and say they hate me. <laughs> Normally people, if they come up to me and they're like, hey, one guy came up to me one time and was a bit of a dick and I just told him I wouldn't be having it. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> I was just like, look, I'm not gonna, he just didn't like one particular video or one take I had. And I was just like, bro, um, this isn't appropriate. He just kind of realized that no, I was just having uh, a, a meal. Or like, not even a meal, just drinks with a friend of mine in a pub. <laughs> and I think he just realized it wasn't appropriate. He left. <laughs> and I'm like, good. Only one time ever that I've had a negative fan interaction. Fan <laughs> is mildly uncomfortable. You're tacky and I hate you. 
One man was sent all over the world to confront various dangerous animals while armed with nothing but a paper fan. Those animals included a lion, a bear, a crocodile, a Komodo dragon, and a mountain gorilla. Dude, that mountain gorilla is gonna tear your face off and wear it as a mask, bro. That's more than a little irresponsible, but at least you got to travel the world for free. Bro. <laughs> You don't want to, how, how bad do you want a free holiday? It's like, hey, you get a free trip to Bali and all you have to do is have your face ripped off by a mountain gorilla. F that, bro. The other world traveler was not so lucky. His challenge, called the Stop AIDS campaign, didn't have to go badly. His job was to wear a wire, then go into gay bars in London, San Francisco, and Sydney to hand out condoms. Honestly, that sounds like the most harmless of any of these. That sounds like a good dude. What's going to go wrong? I'm assuming he's just wearing the wire because, oh no, what if this is going to go onto TV and they're not going to blur people's faces in the gay bar, are they? Is that what's going to happen? Because that's not okay. <laughs> Uh, going to a bar where everyone is looking to hook up and handing out tons of free condoms seems like a good way to get free drinks and be the most popular guy in the room. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. At one of the bars, another man began sexually harassing the contestants. As the situation intensified, the show's crew did not try to step in and extract him. Instead, after the entire ordeal was finally over, they decided to air the audio of his assault on the show. And this was the tamer prototype of the show that would eventually follow. Oh my god, this isn't the show? Okay, I thought it was going to be worse than... And I guess I, <laughs> I thought it was going to be worse than sexual assault. Well done, Simon. You trying to get yourself cancelled? <laughs> you know what I mean? I thought like it was going to be something douchey that the guy that the show did, but it was something douchey that someone else did. Um, wait, so this was the this was the light version of the show. Oh, my God. Where are we going? <laughs> ratings gold. Game show contestants have to go through a screening process to make sure they're adequately entertaining. One of my friends auditioned to be on Deal or No Deal, which is the Deal or No Deal. Does it is that presented by Noel, Noel Coward? Noel Coward? Is that really his name? His name is Coward? That doesn't sound right. His name's Noel Coward? It is Noel Coward. Hey Siri, who is Noel Coward? Now nah, it's telling me it's some playwright of some kind. He's apparently very flamboyant. Time Ra Magazine did a write-up on him. Siri, shut the f*** up. I don't care. Stop, Siri! I don't need to know about Lance Coward's whole life! Why is he now... Now why is he called Lance? I don't know. Stop talking! Daddy, chill. Um, look. Noel Coward's. We're just going for it. The dick dude who presented Deal or No Deal. What was I going back to? I'm like six threads deep. Uh, Deal or No Deal is a boring show. All it is, is someone guessing at there's, there's numbers and they just guess and it, there's no skill involved. The only tiny bit of skill is negotiating with the banker, which makes no sense. And you might be wondering why, Simon, if you find the show so boring, have you seen so much of it? Because it was on in the TV in the day room when I was at school. We'd watch Jeremy Kyle and Deal or No Deal. And I have no idea why. <laughs> I have no idea why that's what we chose to watch. Why didn't we just have BBC World News on? I don't know. I, don't, I guess Jeremy... Oh my god, Jeremy Carl eventually got cancelled, didn't they? Because someone killed themselves or some shit. God, what a piece of shit. Deal or No Deal is also a piece of shit. Although it takes, you know, a, a very talented presenter to make random guessing entertaining. So I guess props to you, Mr. Coward. Is it really coward? Everyone British in the chat is now in the chat, in the, in the comments, is like screaming at me right now. But I don't know. Hey Siri, who presents Deal or No Deal? Now Siri's completely silent. Guess, guess he... Oh my god, it's trying to play like Apple Music for like Hanoi or Deal or something. And I'm like, why would I want to listen to a band called Hanoi or Deal? How... I'm not happy. Not happy. One of my bosses also auditioned, uh, but I guess his story was either not funny or heartwarming enough. Oh, Kevin's friend who went on Deal or No Deal or wanted to go on Deal or No Deal. I mean, I'd do it for money. I mean, not now because I have enough money, but like back in the day when, you know, winning like five grand. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't say no to five grand, but how, you know, do I have to go somewhere? 
How long is it going to take? Do I have to wear a shirt? One of my bosses is also auditioned to be on a game show where he was told, if we need a new host, we'll give you a call. This was obviously not a serious offer and was the casting director's way of saying that he was upstaging the actual host. When it came to Den Parshonen, the producer decided on what he felt was a surefire winning strategy to ensure the contestants would all be entertaining enough. They almost exclusively hired young, aspiring comedians who would do absolutely anything to become famous. I have to say, that's going to be a really good group of people to call from for a reality show because they're probably going to be at least reasonably funny and also desperate, which we all know makes the best contestants for reality television. And we do mean anything. One of the more memorable challenges on the show saw two men stranded on a deserted island. They had no food or supplies of any kind and they tried to build a raft and sail back to Tokyo. Feels like they've wandered into a Mr. Beast video. They were able to accomplish this in only four months without either man resorting to cannibalism, so good on them. That's wild. <laughs> Unfortunately, the producers didn't care for that shit at all. Whenever a contestant could be completed a challenge too easily, they would simply move the goalposts to ensure that the show had enough content. In this case, the two contestants were then dropped off in India, given a paddle boat, and told to take it to Indonesia. That's a distance of nearly 4,500 nautical miles. Which is really far. Almost there. Seawater makes you crazy! Another challenge on the show saw two contestants dropped off at the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. They had one year to hitchhike from the bottom of Africa to Nordcap at the top of Norway and were forbidden from using any money. This also meant that they had to beg for food and water in order to survive. The pair managed to make it as far as the Sahara Desert before one of them collapsed of dehydration and had to be airlifted to the hospital. I mean, that does kind of, kind of sound like an incredible adventure. These were cruel, dangerous, and nearly resulted in someone's death. But they pale in comparison to the most famous of all challenges on Denpa Shonen. Oh my god, where the f*** do we go from here? There's a... <laughs> It feels like a Mr. Beast video. Can you survive on the moon for one hour? And here's the twist. We gave no one a... spacesuit. <laughs> Why can I think of the term? It is. Like, don't get me wrong, I love Mr. Beast. Everyone loves Mr. Beast. But it's like, the, the shouting is like, I dropped six people off at the moon! <laughs> Can they survive one hour without a spacesuit? Stay tuned to find out! So you're dead? Now what? I am the eggplant. At the age of 23, comedian... Tomoki Hamatsu thought he was ju thought he'd just gotten the luckiest break of his life after standing in a room of other comedians to compete for a spot on an upcoming reality show. He reached into a box and pulled out a piece of paper. As the hopefuls unfolded their paper, it was Tomoki whose paper said that he was selected. He commented that he felt like he'd just used up an entire lifetime's worth of luck, something the show made sure to highlight when the episode first aired. Tomoaki was blindfolded and driven to a secret location, an apartment building. Once he was inside, he looked around the living quarters. There was a table with a telephone, a radio, some pens, and thousands of postcards. The kitchen had a single burner stove, and he had a bathroom, complete with a toilet and bathtub with running water. The apartment was even fitted with both heating and air conditioning. Have I vaguely heard of this story? Does he have to write letters to get everything he needs for free? I feel like I've vaguely heard of this. And I thought this must be one of those fake ones that Kevin was talking about at the beginning. Already it sounds like his challenge was going to be far less taxing than the others we mentioned. The only other things in the room were a single cushion and a rack full of issues of all the latest magazines. It is what I think it is. That's when he was told to strip naked and that his name was now Nasubi. Nasubi is the Japanese word for aubergine, which is the British word for eggplant. <laughs> he was given... <laughs> You're welcome, America. He was given this name both because his face was rather elongated, somewhat resembling an eggplant, and also because an eggplant emoji was what the producers were going to use to cover his d balls when his naked body aired on live TV for the next 15 months. You see, while Nasubi did have basic utilities, that was it. He had no food, no clothing, and unlike the other contestants who were stranded in remote locations, he had no companion. His mission was to use the postcards to enter sweepstakes that he could find in the magazines or hear on the radio, and he could not leave the apartment until he'd won a million yen worth of prizes. That's roughly $10,000. Nasubi had been told that they were trying an experimental reality program to see if a person could survive off sweepstakes winnings. He was encouraged to write in a diary and keep a video journal using a camera on the wall. What he was unaware of was that every single thing he did was going to be broadcast live 24 hours a day with a weekly Sunday show featuring the best bits of that week and a lot of sound effects and graphics to mock him endlessly. He didn't have to sign a release? <laughs> Dude. These Sunday shows were Japan's highest rated television show ever, maxing out at 17 million live viewers. God 
Damn. At first, he thought it was, a, it was a joke, but reality quickly set in, and the naked Nasubi spent hours every day filling out postcards. The first week, his phone rang once, but it was a wrong number. A few weeks later, another phone call came from someone looking to indoctrinate him into a multi-level marketing scheme. When that segment aired on Denpa Shonen, a cheerful female voice interrupted to remind all the viewers that these sorts of calls are scams and they will absolutely destroy your life, so at least they did, did one good thing in four years of this program. Four years? I thought you said it was 15 months. What the f***? Despite it being a scam and despite Nasubi being confined to the apartment, he stayed on the phone for over 30 minutes because he had no one else to talk to. His only other company had been a delivery man who dropped off the first prize he won, a 12-pack of juice boxes. But delivery people aren't inclined to hang out and talk with a naked dude holding a cushion to cover himself while signing for a package. I get so many deliveries. I could just imagine like the FedEx man coming in and I'm just like, boop, 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 hello. And he'd be like, whoa. <laughs> Package, Mr. Whistler. <laughs> there had actually been one other visitor, but it was just a prank to further torture Nasubi. A takeout driver accidentally showed up to the wrong apartment with some ramen and vegetables. They knew he had no way to pay, and it was just a sick joke meant to make his apartment smell of delicious ramen. How is he surviving? I mean, they can't starve him to death, but it wasn't long before Nasubi won some more food. A five kilogram bag of rice. Unfortunately, he didn't have a pot to cook it in. But starvation apparently breeds captivity, and he figured out that he could empty juice boxes of containers for the rice and some water, and and then place them next to the burner for about three hours to turn it into something edible. That's a big bag of ricey rum, but it's not enough to last for a year. Most of the food he would consume for the remainder of the year was dog food. Dude. <laughs> this is horrible. And for anyone wondering, it took him a month to finally win some soap and ten months to win some toilet paper. As the years went on, Nasubi slowly increased his winnings with prizes of various utility, but never any clothes. The only clothes he ever won were some panties that were too small for him. Early on, he won VHS tapes, a TV, and a PlayStation game and a controller, but no VCR or PlayStation. He won tickets to movies he couldn't attend and a bicycle that he couldn't ride anywhere, though he did convert that into a stationary exercise bike. He also won a stuffed animal that he elevated the role of his sensei and would converse with it in an attempt to keep his sanity, like Tom Hanks and Wilson in Castaway. Yeah, I'd be like, <laughs> wait, isn't the Oh yeah, it's from that show. I was just thinking I'd do the exact same thing, but I've seen it on that uh, The Last Man on Earth where he's like, ah, talking to a, ba a basketball, that's crazy talk, and then like cut to him like having like 17 different baseballs to talk to. Batman, look at the size of those balls. It was around this time the paparazzi began attempting to swarm the apartment. They had managed to pinpoint its location from the live broadcast, so Nasubi needed to be moved. He and his prizes were transported to a new apartment, and again he was stripped naked. He would be one moved one more time before the show concluded. He wound up winning a PlayStation and played the single game he had, a train simulator game, for about four days straight before realizing he should probably get back to work so his nightmare could eventually end. On the th what is the prize? If this isn't millions of dollars, it's going to be really disappointing because... Why wouldn't you just quit? On the 335th day, he received his final prize, a set of four tires worth about $840. But the producers didn't want the show to end. It was far too popular. Nasubi was told he was winning a vacation to an amusement park in South Korea, which was true. But when the day was over, he was taken to an apartment and told to get naked again. <laughs> Dude, this has got to just mentally destroy you, right? Just gotta be mentally destructive to it's like torture if he wanted to return to japan he'd have to win enough money to earn a plane ticket back they also gave him a dictionary this time so that he could translate the korean magazines that he had no other way to read having become a pro now it took him only a couple of weeks to reach the goal he was then told he had to win enough for a business class ticket then first class those goals were also met, met quickly and he was flown back to japan once there he was blindfolded again and taken to another apartment on instinct he began removing his clothes before the walls fell away to reveal the line studio audience. Until that point, he still believed that nothing he had done had yet to add. Oh my god. I feel like if he if he doesn't have a mental breakdown right now, he's gotta be like the most mentally strong dude who ever existed. Like those guys who like survive in Gitmo for like years or buried a the hole in the desert or whatever. Like this guy. This is the guy. Oh. After the entire experiment was over, he was left somewhat traumatized and malnourished. It was six months before he could comfortably wear clothes again, and even longer before he could carry on a conversation. Due to the pronged isolation, the once talkative and energetic man now struggled to speak at a normal pace. He eventually recovered, and while he remained a bit of a celebrity, he never became the famous comedian he hoped he would. The biggest role he would get to play outside of being tortured on live television was in some very on-brand public service announcements to convince people to comply with the stay-at-home orders 
during COVID. It was nearly 20 years later, and being locked in a room against his will was still all Nasubi was known for. But hey, that's probably more than what you're known for, bruh. I don't even know what to say. This is normally like fun. This is just they tortured him. Why did he quit? What did he even win? <laughs> Oh, Nazubi, it's not even your real name. The final straw. So what does it take to get a show like this cancelled, you ask? Well, they had done some pretty horrific sh** already, but it took baseball to finally get them taken off the air. A group of baseball superfans were selected to participate in what would become the show's final season, and the rules were simple. Each day, they would watch their favorite team play. If they won, they were given food. If their team lost, the oh, this isn't entirely... Wait, is this related to him? Oh, okay, this is a different challenge. Okay, sorry, I, I just got so absorbed in the last one. Each day, they would watch their favorite team play. If the team won, they were given food. If the team lost, the power to the apartment would be cut until the next game. That meant if any of the teams involved were on a really bad losing streak, the contestants would starve to death. The contestants' faces were also censored. If their team won, along with getting to eat, they would have part of their face revealed to the public. That meant that in order for them to gain any notoriety from the show, their team would need a strong winning streak. There is no world in which this idea was going to be good. Japanese baseball teams play six days per week. Even if the team had a 66% win rate for the season, which is higher than any team has had in the past four years, the fan of that team would still only get to eat four times during the week. Fortunately, American television would never do anything so cruel. Instead, we only get classy shows like MILF Manor, a show in which a bunch of 50-plus-year-old women compete for the affection of 20-year-old men who also happen to be the sons of the other female contestants. Yeah, MILF Manor's f***ing wild! I was like, asked my wife if she wanted to watch this, and she was like, no, we're not watching that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, come on, it'll be so terrible, it's good. And she's like, dude, no. We already watch enough sh reality TV. <laughs> we only really watch one. Marriage or Mortgage on Netflix. It's truly dreadful. But not Milf Manor dreadful. You're not, you're not calling him dad, you're calling him daddy. No, I'm calling him daddy. <laughs> that is a very real show, so it's probably only a matter of time before some American TV executive decides to adapt one of these Japanese family game shows for Western audiences. Family game shows. It's a naked dude eating rice from a juice box. What's going on? Thanks for watching. So I'm sorry anyone who believes that one of the hosts was really a Frenchman named Guy Ledouche. <laughs> Mwah!